Hello, everyone. I call this meeting, this October 30th, 2024 special meeting of the Public Safety and Prevention Tax Citizen Oversight Committee to order at 3 o'clock p.m. I'm going to take roll call. Chair Minor, I am here. Vice Chair Kasten. Here. Member Atkinson. Member Bailey. Here. Member Crossgrove. Here. Member Hennig. Here. Member Holmes. Here. Let the order reflect that all subcommittee members, members are present with the exception of Mans, um, Chair Atkinson. Madam Holmes, will you please explain how the public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Chair Minor. Welcome, committee members, members, members of the public. Thank you for joining us today in person and via Zoom. This meeting is being recorded. As a reminder to all, please, present, please set your cell phones so as not to disturb others. The city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment, free from disruption, and will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. We have provided a hard copy of today's agenda. Please feel free to use one of one to follow along. After an agenda item has been presented, the chair will ask the committee members for their comments or questions, and then immediately following their discussion, the chair will open the sides of the public comment. If you are attending in person and wish to comment, you will be called on when the agenda item is open for public comment. Please raise your hand and indicate that you would like to comment. Once you have been called on, you will be asked if you wish to state any of the record. The comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will be set at the host table which will sound at the end of three minutes with a series of beeps. If you do not have a comment but would like to ask questions relevant to the jurisdiction of this committee, there are forms located at the entrance of the conference room. Complete the form and leave it on the table. Staff liaison will address your questions appropriately prior to the next scheduled meeting. Our meeting format is integrated to allow members of the public to use and Zoom to view and listen to the meeting. Any email comments that were received by the deadline would have been included and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Any emails received are not read into the record. Thank you. Just really quick, I want to make sure that everybody is aware we only have one microphone. So we need you to use your outside voices, if you will, so that we can hear everybody and they can hear you on Zoom. With that being said, <clears throat> members of the committee that were present at our last special meeting, are there any edits or corrections you would like to have to the minutes of April 10, 2024? I'll go ahead and move approval of the minutes. Second. Okay. With no additional edits, the minutes for April 10th, 2024 are approved as submitted. We are moving on to item three, scheduled items. Uh, fiscal year 23-24 annual report. This will be a three-part presentation to review and approve the 23-24 annual report. We have presenters today from the fire department in this order, police and violence prevention, and we're going to go ahead and get started with fire. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Minor, members of the committee. Scott Westro, Fire Chief of the City of Santa Rosa. Uh, with me, as always, is our finance analyst, Sarah Roberts. Um, we're going to split the presentation. I'll let uh, Sarah handle the numbers here in the first three slides. All right, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Maybe two more slides. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's okay, you were doing a lot. <laughs> All right, so the fire department beginning fund balance for PSAP uh, on 7-1-2023 was 4.1 million. Um, within the fiscal year, we had revenues of 4.6 million, um, interest and other revenues of $176,000. And our expenditures were 4.3 million and our encumbrances were $876,303. Uh, the encumbrance again is for our Type 1 fire engine that was purchased along with four other engines through the general fund. Um, that was purchased in 20, or that purchase order was created in October of 2022 and approved, uh, but we're still waiting on delivery. So that encumbrance will go away upon delivery of that engine. Um, we ended the fund balance on 630 2024 with 3.7 million. Next, thank you. Next 
Our actuals for 23-24, our salaries and benefits were 2, 2 million, uh, benefits were 1.3, and our services and supplies were $398,416. Um, $88,000 of that was fleet maintenance, uh, fuel and equipment rental and repair. And 52,000 of that was our liability insurance just related to the PSAP fund. Um, and also includes our station 11 expenditures. Um, next slide please. And this is just a slide showing our revenues and expenditures um, since the inception of the fund. So as you can see, it's going down slightly with our expenditures. Um, uh, sorry, our expenditures are leveling off, but our revenues are also going down as well. Thank you. Um, so just as a review for the committee, um, as you all know, there, there's really in the simplest terms, three things that the fire department can spend uh, PSAP funds on, which is personnel, facilities, and special equipment. Um, currently we have three uh, fire captain positions, which are in the suppression a division of the operations bureau. So the frontline supervisors um, that are paramedics that are funded through PSAP. Um, we have our training captain assigned to our training facility on West College. Uh, three engineer paramedics who are um, the operators of our apparatus and three firefighter paramedics. 25% um, of our uh, division chief of EMS is funded through, I change that, PSAP. Um, it's a little throwback for everybody there. <laughs> And uh, as many times as we look at these slides. Um, <laughs> and then the paramedic incentive pay for six firefighters, which makes our two truck companies on the west side and downtown uh, paramedic level of service. Uh, next slide, please. So the impacts of PSAP, um, essentially, as I've explained before, the, the nine suppression positions equate to an entire engine company. So we takes nine people to staff an engine company 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, and so just to put that in frame of reference, and this was something really big as we were going through the reform for measure O to measure H, um, was that that's about 10% of our effective firefighting force. So we have 10 engines on duty every day and the two ladder trucks. Um, so it equates to an entire engine that's funded through this tax measure. Um, we also have a training captain and the training captain runs our training facility schedules and administers all of our training. Um, and also does all of our recruit academies. And last year they did four recruit academies and this coming year we're probably gonna do at least four uh, with County Measure H coming on board. So it's a very vital and important position for us. Um, the, we have three engines that are paramedic and as I stated before, two ladder trucks that are paramedic through uh, PSAP funding. And then the EMS division chief, their job is to oversee all things in emergency medical services. That equates to about 65% of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis for the fire department. Um, and also that's, that's in addition to what they do for in response with the single role paramedics. Take all that into account, we've improved our response time and our deployment of our resources, which in turn reduces fire loss, um, improves patient outcomes, increases community outreach, and we financed uh, some fire stations. We'll get to on the next slide uh, through PSAP. Through PSAP. Next slide, please. So for the fire stations, as we've been over before, um, PSAP funded station 10, which was constructed in 2008. And it also houses our fire administration uh, building. Fire station 11, which is in the junior college uh, district was opened in 2009. And fire station five, which opened in 2016 and we lost in the Tubbs fire. Um, one thing of note is that um, you'll see in our transfer out that we talked about early on, that'll be the last payment. Uh, for the debt service on the fire station that burned down. Um, so that's good news that that debt service is falling off at the end of this fiscal year. Um, and the only thing we, we added into the slides here, and thanks to Tricia for taking care of this, is that's a live stream view of the current fire station five construction on the corner of Parker, Parker Hill and Fountain Grove, um, or Stagecoach and Fountain Grove. Um, so People make fun of me because I have it up on one of my monitors all the time and I just sit there and watch the progress daily, which is painful and slow. And they're like, oh, that's what the fire chief does, just watches other people work. And so, um, but you can see there is physical progress. This is from last week. Um, there is physical progress. There's stem walls going in. So we're making um, pretty good progress there on, on fire station five and it's a new site. Next slide, please, Sean. And then as far as equipment added, um, as Sarah talked about, we've purchased two type one fire engines through PSAP. Um, one is on the way still. 
Um, we just received two fire engines that we ordered in December of 21 um, last month. So we got about a four year build time. Um, we still have engine 25, which is a very busy resource for us, four command vehicles, a swift water rescue trailer, and we've installed all the mobile radios and mobile repeaters that were purchased from PSAP. So with that, I will turn it over to the committee for any questions or comments you may have. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Great. I love the photos too. I was going to ask, I know the last time you all were talking about possibly kind of coming up, with, coming up with a way to display the diversity of the firefighter and stuff and possibly to track, you know, possibly the youth, maybe at risk and such. Just wondered that. How's that part of this going? And I remember when you had that event coming up. Yeah, so um, all of the, the DEIB projects that were funded through PSAP are enacted this year. So this is the report on last fiscal year. So I made a mistake and told Sarah you missed the slide and then she reminded me what we were doing. But um, so as of July 1st, those programs are funded. So with that's coming the Explorer Post, which will go in the Roseland, new, new Roseland Fire Station. Um, the team's working on development of that. All the ground works laid. We're just working with legal on that process. So that'll bring in youth of the community from 14 to 20 to expose them to what a life in the firehouse looks like, what a career entails, get them some training. They won't go to emergency events, obviously, but um, we have a team built out for that. So that's moving along well. Uh, Women in Public Safety Day, um, which I think was coming up last time, has been exceedingly successful. We're seeing 400 or so participants a year coming to that event. Um, and I think I said this before, but we were targeting, you know, high school, junior college age, um, females or anybody really. And what we're starting to see, which is great, is um, actually little girls coming. And in fact, there's, there was a picture of Sarah's daughter in the paper wearing a princess dress spraying water on her fire hose. So it's really, it's really been um, a great event and very successful. We continue to fund that. Um, our mentorship program is also funded through that. Um, and so we have approximately 40 to 50 mentees. Um, and every time we go to an event, we can have kids sign up for either the mentorship program or the Explorer program through a QR code. Um, the first time I went, we brought a piece of paper to sign up on and realized I'm getting older and that doesn't work anymore. So now we just put it right on their phone and they can put a few things in and we'll contact them for that. Um, and so all those programs are moving along very well and uh, we're seeing a lot of success there. It's very much a strategic vision. It's a long-term vision of, you know, we want kids in our community to know that we're there for them. And there is a possibility of a job in the fire service that really isn't that hard, really from, from the beginning of their school all the way through high school and into the junior college. And so um, we have a great outreach team that's out there um, engaged with the youth of our community. And, and I think we're really starting to uh, see some successes there and we will in the future for sure. Thank you. And then that, that mentee program, if someone wanted to sign up, is that somewhere on the website or is that like one of the? It's, I don't know if it's on the website or not. Okay. I'd have to go and look. Um, but with the funding from, from PSAP, um, one of the things we're really trying to do is, is meet the youth where they are. And so it's, you know, the social media and making sure that it's easily accessible. I say the QR code jokingly, but um, it's trying to, to put in place the systems to meet the kids where they are. So that'll be something that we'll be investing in as well. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. I have a question not for fire if other folks have. <coughs> so, Ron, is there a section of the presentation where you're talking about the fund as a whole? Um, um, well, the fire fund is its own fund. Right. So when you saw, yeah, the financial slides that Sarah presented a few slides ago, that is this fund as a whole, but it's, it's really at the annual report. It's kind of a historic look right. for the past year. Uh, I don't even worry about my question. Is there a section in the presentation where we'll be talking about the overall health of the PSAP funds? Um, or are we just looking at it? We look at them individually because they do have different setups. Each has a different mix of FTE staffing versus program staffing. So we do look, yeah, we don't look at any, there's no place in the presentation where we see a whole altogether. So I have a whole all fund concern that I'd like to discuss. And I want to leave as much time for some of the qualitative questions, but I feel like it's pretty germane to the um, to our potential comments to council. And I want to make sure we have time for it. So, see, Alan, wanting so well, no, I, we can either 
Yes. I think we can reserve some time at the end of, of this to be able to, because uh, then you'll see all of the funds and then it'll be, uh, we, we can cover it. I'm just fighting because I also know we're on a tight time limits by our uh, taskmaster over here. <laughs> so, um, oh, yeah, I'll hold my question to the end then. Yeah, thank you. I just have a quick question, actually. Um, I was just curious, what takes so long to build a fire station? It seems like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a guitar. I'm a period. Like, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. <laughs> um, so fire station five in particular was really challenging because um, of the FEMA process. And so when it burned down as part of a federally declared disaster, um, we went in and, and worked with FEMA to try to Get them to pay for us not only to build the station but we wanted to move the station the reason we want to move the station was the previous station five was built it was cheap it was free land um, it seemed like it was a great place to build but it's at the top of geographically it's the top of a bunch of fire prone conditions and so it's really at the top of a hill um, also we were having some response times problems in there so but fema and i don't want to get too long-winded about this but fema is set up for midwest disasters right it's it's floods, hurricanes, and tornadoes. So they kept coming back and denying our claim because we were moving it lower, even though it's at 1,500 feet in elevation, we were moving it lower into the floodplain. So we've actually had to go through and through this process, help rewrite the Stafford Act into the Fire Act with, um, with Senator Padilla to encompass wildfires now. So um, we actually ended up getting that funded and it took several years to get it funded through HUD, uh, through HCD. Um, so the FEMA never funded it. So really the long answer to your short question was a lot of it was the funding mechanism of it. Yeah. Um, and then it's, it takes two years to build a commercial building. And so um, once we broke ground and went through all the contracts and everything, we broke ground. Um, it's about two years um, to get from groundbreaking to um, implementation. And that's what we're seeing with station eight. Um, it's just commercial buildings just take a long time. And so going through the Actually, of all levels of government, and then into the um, contracting phase and into the construction phase, just takes a long time. But Station Five was exceedingly long due to the funding questions that we had and what we wanted to do with the property. Thank you. Okay, if there's no further questions, we're going to go ahead and move on to police. Thank you, Chair Ryder and members of our committee. I'm John Creek, our Chief of Police. I'm joined by our Administrative Services Officer, Pam Lawrence, and I'm going to turn it over to Edsel Lawrence for our first briefing. For being here. Um, so this slide shows our, our beginning fund balance of 3.2 million. Our sales tax revenues for last year were 4.6 million. Our interest and other revenues, which included some rents that we got from the library that we purchased, um, 177,000, and our expenditures were 6.5, which included the purchase of the books. He rose and said. Next slide, please. This slide just breaks down where those funds were actually spent. So we spent 2.2 million on salaries for our staff that are in this, um, are funded by PSAP, and then did 1.6 million. Services and supplies of 331,000. This includes our Axon fleet trainers and all of our patrol vehicles, as well as our DET lease, our downtown enforcement team lease at the um, transit mall, and our lease, our new lease at the Roseland, in the Roseland area. And then we had 120,000 in administration, which is our overhead costs for the city. And then the land was the purchase of that library. Next slide, please. This same is what fire showed. Um, you notice our revenues and expenditures since the beginning of the program. And you can see um, we've been really trying to keep our expenditures in line with our um, revenues. But last year it spiked greatly because of the purchase of the library. Next slide. All right, we'll briefly go through a uh, kind of overview of how we're actually using these funds. So the meat of ours is actually on full-time employee positions. So we have 17 full-time employees that are funded through PSAP with the addition of two uh, student interns. And as we break down the 17 employees, we have the one lieutenant in our field services division, and that lieutenant runs our special events. So anything that we're having like a downtown or at the country summer or the fairgrounds, any of those special events that has the teams of the downtown enforcement team and our traffic teams. And our traffic teams are composed of six motorcycle officers and four accident investigators slash DUI uh, enforcement officers that work uh, in the evening and overnight. We 
but the, then we have two sergeants. One of these was an additional one last year of our gang crimes team sergeant, and the other sergeant is deployed to our motorcycle team for our traffic team. Then the nine police officers, five of those are additions to patrol, and that's really helping us drive down our priority one response time, having a more visible presence uh, out in the community. <coughs> two were assigned to the downtown enforcement team, and two were assigned to our uh, traffic motorcycle team. Then for our civilians, as we break it down here, we have five civilian positions in there, uh, two for the field and evidence technicians, and these are uh, positions that go out and process all major crime scenes across the city of Santa Rosa, making sure that we have appropriate uh, evidence collected and they present that in court. We also have a crime lab at the police department. They process fingerprints and DNA and, and other physical evidence to be presented in court. Community service officer that responds as a uniform position that's out in the community and responding to uh, more low level calls of, of non-injury collisions and no suspect information reports, but it was really critical to us it's important to have the documentation on those, and it frees up officers to respond to more priority calls and help with our priority one response times. Uh, communication uh, dispatch supervisor. So we have three supervisors that are working uh, throughout the day to manage our 24 dispatchers and all the emergency calls that are coming into there. Last year, we had over 250,000 calls that came into our 911 dispatch center. <coughs> Excuse me. One police technician, and that works in our records department are processing thousands of reports, um, uh, traffic citations and all the other paperwork that comes in the police department and making sure that we can give it in a timely manner when community members want to get a copy of the report or whatever paperwork that they have an interaction with us. And what we talked about before here that we're really proud of is having our two student interns. These are paid positions 20 hours a week up to and they work at all different areas of the police department. We have them sometimes in our own crime center, sometimes in records uh, with our working with our vehicles and we're, we're excited that we've seen several that have applied for jobs and have come in one of our uh, former interns is in the police academy right now uh, with our now so we're really excited uh, to be able to see that uh, that they're becoming part of the SRPD family and continuing to be able to utilize their skills uh, with it but then also be able to hopefully get them hired as uh, employees here with the police department so we're really happy about that we'll go to the next slide I talked briefly about the enhanced patrol <laughs> services that we're getting and some of that comes with so many of these things that uh, our day-to-day -day operations are just responding to calls, but PSAP really gives us the ability to be able to enhance that. And some of that is we really had to focus on more foot patrols, not only downtown, but in our uh, different uh, neighborhoods across our community. We've been working on one in Roseland right now, but having more visible foot patrols in Roseland, the same thing of apartment complexes and shopping centers across the city. And this has given us that ability the same with traffic enforcement. We've really seen a lot of community focus on what we can do toward increasing our traffic enforcement. I was just looking at the numbers that we got today. Of um, Last year, we did a total of just over almost 16,000 uh, traffic stops. This year, we're up already just through the uh, end of September that we're almost 18,000 traffic stops. So that's a lot of traffic stops throughout the city of Santa Rosa. And so far, just to the end of September, we've given 7,700 traffic citations across the city of Santa Rosa. So a lot, but this PSAP is giving us the ability, not only with the dedicated motorcycle officers that are part of the team and the supervisor, but the additional patrol resources to be able to do that. And then also to really focus on some of the violence reduction. We're gonna talk about some of those stats in a minute. And one thing that's been a, a core uh, area that we've been focusing on during my time as chief is community engagement of getting out there, whether it be the coffee with a cop or tacos with a cop, or just getting out like kind of more like holistically in our community and really been focusing and peace out really giving us the ability to be out there in the community and really be engaged and work with some of our other city departments out there. Next slide, please. This is what we talked about is the reinstatement of the gang crimes team. And we have a lot of real like uh, honest conversations in this room about that, about what are going to be the impacts of the gang crime team. And that's where we're really proud that we're focused that this team is not focused just on enforcement. And we've said many times before, we're never gonna arrest our way out of the gang problem. So we have these four prongs here of our gang crimes team of prevention and intervention. And we're really working with the violence prevention partnership and so much we're really doing to be able to use our other city departments to be able to see like what we do to prevent kids from ever getting into gangs with that, the intervention. And this is where it's so important of our gang crimes team going to the operational meetings and presenting at the policy team meetings with the partnership and then really using their referral system about being able to refer some of the young men and women in our city who need some help and support and use the amazing resources that we have right there in our partnership 
with an education as well. We were just part of our gang crime team, uh, which is part of the VPP's uh, gang seminar. They'll probably be talking about some of those like that and we're able to present on some of the dangers of ghost guns and some of the other things like that. And that's really important for us to be able to get in before whether they're going to schools, talking to parents, talking to kids about some of the education piece and enforcement at the end of the day is a critical you know, part of it that they're continuing to do. And we'll see what we'll talk about some of the that, but we're seeing violence very measurably decreasing in the city of Santa Rosa this year. And I think the gang crime team, uh, which was helped made possible by PISA is a big part of that. The dedicated lieutenant we talked about here, and then really working with our downtown team. Uh, we were able to host a resource to expand our downtown enforcement team to eight full-time officers that are working now seven days a week. And undeniably downtown is the best we've ever seen it in many years of really being a safe and vibrant round town and our, and our, our downtown enforcement team has really played a key part of that. And that sergeant is, is specifically comes out of peace out. Next slide, please. The average response time, this is still something that's been a struggle for us that we were above seven minutes. We're really working toward making some progress. This had, it was it's supposed to be 2023 at a glance, uh, has it was just at six minutes and 57 seconds. Looking at the stats today, we're down to six minutes and 36 seconds this year. So we're bringing it down. And we've had a series of meetings over the last couple of months about in the early part of 2025, getting that below six minutes and looking at some different strategies of how we deploy our resources. And now that we're finally getting back up to full staffing and have all of our officer positions filled, it's going to give us the ability to have that uh, faster response time. But without the resources of PSAP, we would really be uh, much closer to eight minutes. Next slide, please. And these are just talking about some of the stats that we have. And I'll just give a very brief overview. And we've talked before, 2022 was a troubling year for the city of Santa Rosa with violence. And we saw uh, 12 homicides, was the most homicides we've had in, the, in our recorded history as a city. We followed that up in 2023 with 10. So we really came together as a city, looking at other city departments, working with the partnership, working with our community about how we could start coming up some strategies with that. And I'm really excited to say this year, we've seen a marked improvement of that. So far in 2024 uh, through today, we've had just two homicides in the city of Santa Rosa. That's still tragedies that we had lost, two lives were lost here in the city of Santa Rosa. But at this time last year, we had eight homicides. So we have a 75% reduction year over year. So that was very, a big step forward, but we're gonna to continue to work with our partners and see what we can continue to move. The same thing with DUI enforcement. We're talking here about the hundreds of DUIs. Uh, we were just in Sacramento just a couple of months ago and our department was awarded as the Northern California Department uh, of the year for our efforts on DUI enforcement. And we got the supervisor of the year too for our traffic sergeant, which is actually funded by PSAP here, was awarded the supervisor of the year for the focus on DUI. And so the significant amount of harm we're able to reduce in our community by getting these impaired drivers off the street. Next slide, please. So that was a, a quick high level overview of what we're doing with uh, PSAP. And I'd love to hear any questions from the committee. Are there any questions? So I do have a quick one. In re relation to the awards that you received, does any funding comes with that? <laughs> we got a really cool plaque uh, <laughs> and a lunch. Uh, uh, that's it. No money. It's, uh, it was through uh, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Oh, so they're not awarding okay. any financial thing, just recognition and trying to also highlight of other agencies what we're doing. And we gave a little presentation on some of the strategies we're doing to increase DUI enforcement and make it part of the culture of our organization. Congratulations. So, thank you. Yeah, congrats on the award. Uh, well, first off, uh, I've seen that a great gosh, event, was it? But uh, I just want to highlight, I definitely have seen you a lot with your, with your, uh, you know, other officers at many community events. I know you had that, the church. They also, yeah, they look. yes. So yeah, just uh, definitely want to commend you for a lot of, I just feel like, you know, like you said, when you first came in, you definitely want to put your face out there and, interact with the community. So I definitely want to commend that, pulling that out there. Uh, a question I had was, uh, do, you, do you have a metric that's measuring the increased community outreach that your officers are participating in? Because I really like this, the chart, you know, like we have this many traffic stops and, you know, it's been increased in load, but is there a, is there a system institute yet that's measuring that, that could be explained in the future? Perhaps? Well, we could. So what we do is, 
I, I'm really a data guy like that. So I, I create like a monthly report that I put out of like for this specific just to our field services division. So that's our uniformed officers. And we talk about, uh, we have four operational objectives that we created when I was chief. And one is violence reduction. The second is traffic safety and enforcement. The third is quality of life, crimes, and mental health resources. And then the fourth is community engagement, because we wanted to say that's just as important to me as getting out there and focusing on violence in our community and things like that. So those are four operational objectives. And then we track like who is doing the most in those four categories. So we do track it individually by the officer. And then I put out each month the, the top 10 officers who did the most in community engagement or violence reduction or whatever it may be. So we track it there. We don't track it in our like in our organizationally, but there might be a way that I could do that where I could have our crime analyst team look at like, okay, how are those numbers going like organizationally? Like, have we seen by you can do it by minute? So have we seen an increase of 10%, whatever, by minute of officers on community engagement events? What we could track and put in here is like the more organized events, like how many of these like more organized events. But what I'm trying to say is don't wait for the organized event. When you're just driving around between calls, get out of your car and go walk in the apartment complex and say hi to people and pass out some stickers. So it's a little bit of both of those. So it's a long way of saying we don't have a specific way of quantifying it right now, but we could come up with strategies to do it. Yeah, and that's great. And uh, like you said, I'm, I'm a big data guy also. So I appreciate you. Because you know, you almost got to think outside the box for, for things, particularly with like, you know, historical aspects and such. So I like that. I think that would help the case particularly, especially with, you know, even just me speaking personally, when I have someone say, you know, I would love to see the police more. And I think that you all are having a lot of amazing events, particularly in strategic locations, you know, that are under-resourced, quote unquote, high crime areas. And that's great. And, and like to be able to showcase that, I think, you know, the community would love that, you know, because it's, it's looking like you're doing it internally, but if that's publicly, I think that it really, uh, it, can, it can really help, particularly, with that, if you could add location, because mm -hmm. obviously we all, unfortunately, you know, statistically, you, you can know where the high crime areas are going to fortunately occur, you know, due to historical reasons. So I think being able to track also location, because obviously it's like specific locations that are, are obviously, you know, high gang area, high violence areas. And just we, we kind of already know that, you know, I think if you add that in, that would be great. Um, that's great. Be back. Well, right back to our case. Yeah, definitely. And then also you brought up the, the foot patrol. I know that's something that, you know, it's uh, just well, not even you. I remember even with like Hank Streeter, the old, you know, the old police chief. I know that's yeah. been a big thing community members have asked for is foot patrol, you know, and obviously you're under, you know, hold on, you're understaffed, you know, so I know that can be very hard, but if there was also a way to track that to seeing how long officers are out of their vehicle and, and walking in, and maybe something I had written down here, maybe even like a logging system that an officer could maybe do their the, do themselves, you know, and uh, possibly even maybe incentivizing it, you know. Obviously, like you said, you sent out an email, so it's it's a great recognition. But maybe if there is maybe you know maybe not using money, maybe a gift card, you know, but incentivizing increased <laughs> foot patrol by officers, particularly in those high quote unquote crime areas, I think would would also be uh, really great. And also, like you said, they're attending the event. So I would have loved to be able to see like, you know, I had 15 officers attend, you know, this event, you know, cause then it actually, it's a metric that can be measured, uh, which is in my opinion, you know, stronger than pictures, but the pictures are great too. But uh, yeah, so besides right. that, yeah, appreciate That's it. That's great feedback. And for us, part of it is like you said, of just coming from me, from the chief of saying, Hey, this is the expectation. This is what I want to see about the foot patrols. And that's what we're doing. So we're seeing some improvements. But we actually had a meeting just on Monday about foot patrols downtown for coming up with the holidays and not focus. We've been saying, like, it can't be just downtown. So we've always had for several years, like the, the volunteers and policing program that we have. We have a BIP ambassador program where they go downtown over the holidays and they even carry like a bag of quarters and fill up like. Uh, so maybe I think Alan might have messed it up with a bit of credit cards now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be so easy, like you put a quarter in the meter. Uh, but they do things like helping through the meters where they give it directions downtown. But we're also going to have the downtown enforcement team. We're going to have officers like assigned on foot patrol shifts like that on downtown Railroad Square, but then looking at other areas. And we just had a, a meeting with the Roseland uh, community just a couple weeks ago, the Boys and Girls Club. We have about 35 business leaders from Roseland come there. And I met with them over some concerns. And one of their biggest concerns is we want more visibility in Roseland. 
So one of the things that's funded by PSAP is it's two part. We bought the library. We're waiting for the herd community hub to be built, and then we'll move into that library. But we have a temporary substation right there in Sebastopol Road, and so we're working with the business leaders about how we can have more visible foot patrols in Roseland and the community over there. So those are some of the things that we're trying to do of, of actually build in shifts that are going to be dedicated. So I met with the beat sergeant, and we're going to talk about like how can officers do at least one hour of their shift that they can on Roseland, and who are working that beat five and beat seven right there. That split Sebastopol Road. So that's what we're trying to do is build some of those mechanisms there. And we are getting up to full staffing now. Uh, right now, we're we're really blessed right now that we have all of our sworn officer positions filled. We still have 11 officers that are in training, but as soon as they get off training in a couple of months, that's going to give us more of this capacity to be able to get out there and handle some of those things. But uh, I'll really work on for our next presentation about how we can quantify more of that for you and the community about that. It would be a really good thing. Definitely. And last thing I'll just add in there, I like. Because I know in the in this with this measure of uh, PSAP, I know like downtown enforcement is something big in there. And also with that, I'd add, especially like, you know, like the area that we know, uh, you know, like the Apple Valley, Valley Oak, the Moreland neighborhoods, quote unquote, all the other ones, like having foot patrol there, I think also <coughs> will be great. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Are there any additional questions? Yes, yeah. the one so um, when we went out for renewal, the top issue that we were hearing from the voters was response times. Uh, in my recollection, is at that time we were up around seven minutes, 30 seconds? 703 we were at last year, like that we were hovering right 703 and 704, but we're trending up. So now, year to date right now, we're at 636 and then really focused on that strategy to get it below six minutes in early 2025. So we're seeing success. What is success? What is the risk? For us, I think success for our, our goal has been in years going back to Hank Treater, you mentioned that was our goal back then, a, a below six minute response time to our priority one call. Now, we'd love to see it even lower like that, but I think that's like a reasonable what we can accomplish with 42 square miles, uh, with a lot of trapping calming measures around the city. And those help with some things, but also it slows down patrol officers and fire trucks responding to calls. Uh, with it. So like and it's a growing city with our traffic. So I think a realistic for our city is no like no longer than six minute response time, but we continue to to work toward avenues for doing that. And we're looking about how we even allocate the resources. We have our city divided into nine separate beats. But those are things like having the Rosen substations. So you don't have Rosen officers driving all the way back to Sonoma to the main station to uh, process reports and evidence and things like that, but staying in Roseland so they can more quickly deploy. We have another uh, substation off of Burnville. And, and in our future, we're going to look at an east side substation or for like maybe Luba or Middle Rinkin or more on the east side because we want resources staying out in the field, not constantly drawn back for administrative work they need to do at the station. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Yeah, I have a bunch that and hopefully okay. fairly quick. Um, I was just looking at your citation rates. And so we looked at how many times you flipped over to and people actually get tickets, and it was 24% last year. It is now, I'm sorry, 24% in 2022. Mm -hmm. It's now 36% in 2023 based on the data that we have. Um, do you have some reason why that rate of when you get pulled over, you actually get a ticket, has increased so much? I think that we've had a department wide focus on traffic safety, and we've had more of our traffic officers out there. So now we're fully staffed with our traffic team. I was a former motorcycle officer. If you get pulled over my motorcycle officer, your odds of getting a brace or slim, uh, like that. Yeah. <laughs> that they're very focused on just doing moving violations. So they're not doing low level things like that. And when they pull you over, it's for a gross moving violation. So having them, I think, but also it's been a, a department focus for me on that. For us, there's three problems of that that we call it like that. Like one of it is enforcement. We work with the engineering side of it with, uh, with our traffic engineering department on some of those things. And then on the education part, but enforcement's a key part of it. And absolutely when you're writing citations, you will improve traffic safety in your community like that. But it needs to be the, that multifaceted approach. But some of it is a focus for me as the chief of get out there and be more, uh, really more prioritizing traffic safety and enforcement across our city. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question was, do you track demographic data of who is getting pulled over and at what rate they're actually getting ticketed? Absolutely. That's a statewide law for okay. the racial identity profiling act. So that comes out once a year. So every contact, now there is a lot of misinformation on RIPA that people think that 
RIPA doesn't mean just a proactive stop. That means anytime anyone's detained across the city. So if we go to a domestic violence call like that, we're detaining a suspect like that, RIPA applies for that. So uh, that data goes out every year like that. So actually it usually releases in October. Uh, that's from the Department of Justice from the state. They haven't released last year's data yet, but it's gonna break down any detention that a Santa Rosa police officer did, it breaks it down on uh, all the demographic data like that, and it breaks that down and including like what action was taken, even breaking it down one step further, were they searched uh, with it, whether it's a citation, were they arrested, it breaks all that down. So you can look at the, like right now we have 2022's data that was released, but 2023 will be released in the coming days. Thank you. Um, and then the final question was, I was just comparing the response time and the total process calls from 2022 to 2023. Um, and there are just like massive differences in the, like the non-emergency call received in 2022 was 131,000. And then 2023, it dropped to 72,000. And I imagine there's like some sort of reclassification or something happening there. Which um, slide are you on? So what is that slide? Give me a second. 19. And I pulled the stuff from previous. our previous meeting. Yeah, I don't oh, know. It could have been just how the data was entered in there. We haven't seen that. There hasn't been a change uh, that drastically in the number of calls we've been hovering. I would say around that one between 115 and 130 is our average calls that an officer actually responds out to. In okay. the middle. So we usually get around 250,000 calls into our 911 dispatch center and about 100 and 20 to 130,000 calls that officers actually respond to. But one thing that's a part of that, that's also including proactive calls that officers go to. So the 18,000 traffic stops we've done this year, that's included in there. Each one of those is a created as a new event so like that. So that's uh, sometimes a, a hybrid of dispatch calls and officers proactively responding to, which hovers around that 130 range. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Thank you. If nothing else, we're going to go ahead and move on to bias prevention. Thank you, Chair uh, Chair Miner and uh, members of the committee. Jeff Tibbetts, Deputy Director with the Recreation Division and the Violence Prevention Partnership, presenting with me today our Program Manager for Violence Prevention Partnership, Daniel Verduno, and our Recreation Supervisor uh, over Neighborhood Services, Joanna Moore. Um, I'm going to run us through the financial slides, but real quick, I wanted to introduce is in the crowd. Um, so we have Jackie Hammond is the new ASO for the Recreation and Parks Department. Uh, she's new enough that I'm still being nice to her and I'm doing this portion of the presentation <laughs> today. Um, but will gladly offer up my seat in the future. Um, so same, same breakdown finances you've seen with the other funds. Uh, so our beginning fund balance of January 1st at uh, $1.5 million. The 23-24 uh, sales tax revenues were $2.3 million. Interest and in other revenues of $70,000. Uh, our expenditure for... 23-24, a little over $2.1 million. Uh, reserved for encumbrances and project commit commitments, um, about $800,000. That uh, encumbrance is actually part of the Choice Grant Program. So since 23-24 was year two of that three year, we, you may recall we did a three year process so that it aligned with the expiration of Measure O. Um, so that money was actually encumbered in the 23-24 budget, but that $797,000 will go towards the choice program of this year. So that's how it's supposed to be set up financially, but in terms of, you know, the ending fund balance of 998,000 um, is a little bit misleading because uh, that is calculating the, uh, the money that was part of the expenditures for choice grant this year, as well as the encumbrance for the following year. Uh, so next slide, please. The breakdown of those, so salaries um, and benefits as general with these breakdowns, uh, a big portion of it you see um, services and supplies for programs, I should say with the salaries and benefits that's, uh, you know, including um, not just our permanent employees, but temporary employees offering programs and, and doing the programs for the youth. And then the choice grants of $820,000 uh, and then administrative cost gets us to that $2.1 of the expenditure for the 23-24 actuals. Next slide, please. And again, the, the chart showing um, that we are doing our best, you know, th these things are unpredictable, but uh, doing our best to stay in line with uh, the rising of revenue and expenditures and, and showing that both areas uh, starting to flatten out as we saw with the other revenues as well. 
Next slide. And with that, I will pass up to Joanna to talk about programming on the prevention side through neighborhood services. I am members of the committee, um, supervisor of neighborhood services. And fiscal year 2023, 2024 was really a great year for neighborhood services, marked with significant achievements and um, quite a few new programs. As we know, primary prevention programming is crucial in our community because it provides, um, because primary prevention is a crucial role in promoting the well being and the safety of our community. And neighborhood services strives to strengthen our community by providing a primary, primary prevention program. And we do this by um, doing several different sports programming and enrichment programming out in the field throughout Santa Rosa. Uh, we saw outstanding participation in our sports programs this past year with 843 enrollments. Our sports programs um, that we facilitated this past year was our junior warriors basketball. We also did our cheerleading, um, our dance program, our futsal program, NFL flag football, and also junior giants um, baseball. And these programs really focus on physical health. Also, um, they um, because of the coaching, there's a lot of mentoring that happens, and these programs really. Um, We've been doing them for a really long time, so they're really established within the community. So when you go out in the field and you witness them, you can really see um, the support um, that is provided for the families and youth that participate in these sports programs. Um, our camps programs att attracted um, 700, 705 enrollments this past year. And um, our camps are facilitated anytime um, that schools are out of session. So. We have great camps and we also do our summertime um, camps. Um, and we are able to go onto school campuses and provide a safe um, environment for kids to learn and play throughout the summer when the schools are in session. <clears throat> Next, we have our enrichment programs. We had just under 200 enrollments um, for our enrichment program. Under this umbrella, we have our after school programs and we partner with Burbank Housing. We have eight different after, after school programs that we do all throughout um, Santa Rosa. We also um, this year launched our new STEM programming, which STEM is um, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we also uh, launched a new arts program as well. And lastly, we have our family events, which is the cornerstone of our community engagement. Um, <coughs> we had 2,400 participants come out for our family events. We have several different events that we do <coughs> year. Um, and these events are, are fairly popular. Next slide. So one of the highlights of this year has been the introduction of our new programs uh, focusing on arts in STEM. We launched our artistic ventures, which includes specialized art classes and family paint nights. And it's been really great to see our families come together and create together. Um, with each session reaching capacity, and we actually um, have wait lists typically for these family paint nights. These family focused um, classes have fostered creativity and strengthened family bonds. We also started an engineering class where participants create Lego pieces and build motors for movement. This class has been a hit with our participants building towers and discussing concepts such as gravity and structural integrity. Um, it's been really great to see our participants in this program we, um, get into the program, and um, it's a lot of hands-on learning, so it's been really nice to see that. Um, we also introduced drumming circles this past summer um, in our camps, and our goal with our drumming um, programming is to partner it with our dance class to where we can have our um, drumming class and create music for our dancers to dance to at the dance recital, um, adding a new dimension of these programs and providing a stage for a creative expression through the music and movement. Um, also this past year that was new, we um, had our first ever art show. All of our summer locations created art, um, uh, some individual pieces and some collaborative pieces, and they were showcased at the Steel Lake Community Center, where we invited the community, we invited our families, our participants to come out and view all the art that was created. Uh, over the summer. And that top logo that you see there, the city of Santa Rosa, um, that's actually a collaborative piece. Um, and I'm gonna read about that art uh, that was created by our participants. I'm gonna read the description of that. 
how they did that. I just don't want to mess up um, how they created that arm. So this is from um, Piner High School, and it's our mid-grade camp. And it's just called the City of Santa Rosa Pixelation 2024. It's acrylic and colored pencil on canvas. All the participants and the staff at Piner High School Summer Program completed this collaborative artwork. Originally an idea from a program participant, the site worked together to bring the vision to life and create this wonderful piece. This artwork comprises 18 canvases and 16,200 pixels to form the City of Santa Rosa logo. On the bottom right of the artwork is each artist's signature that contributed to this piece. So you can't see that in the, um, all the artists that contributed to it, but I'm really lucky. I have this actually right now in my office. It's, it's quite a big piece of art. It's about um, three feet by six feet, and our goal is to get it into council chambers. So we've been working with the city manager's office so we can um, get, I guess, get it up into chambers. Next slide. So our partnerships have been instrumental this past year, enhancing the quality and the reach of our programs. We value our collaborations and understand the importance of achieving our goals and leveraging our funds. This past summer, we collaborated with Santa Rosa City Schools and we were able to um, facilitate three summer camps with them. So we did two recreation sensations at different elementary schools and we also did our mid-grade camp at Piner, which is new. The morning um, of the mid grade camp, they participated in the math and STEM programming, and the afternoon was recreation. And this partnership was a huge success. We're actually already in um, talks with San Rosa City School to continue this partnership for um, summer 2025. Um, and, and then another thing that we work very closely with Danielle and her team. Um, and it's been really nice to have them um, in our same building because when we were able to identify any of our um, kids or their families that need a little extra support, we're able to, um, you know, we're able to hand them off to, to Danielle and they're able to hold on our ready to do successfully program. Um, overall, Neighborhood Services is just really proud of the progress that we made this past fiscal year and look forward to um, continue to serve our community. Um, we are grateful for the community's trust and engagement, and together we are building a stronger, safer, more connected community. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Danielle Gardino, Program Manager for the Santa Rosa Violence Prevention Partnership. Uh, jumping right in, we continue this fiscal year implementing the Guiding People Successfully program, uh, also known as GPS. As a reminder, this is a referral program where, uh, which we leverage uh, funding from Sonoma County Juvenile Probation uh, to implement um, and provide staffing uh, for one of the coordinator positions. Um, this involves um, receiving the referral from either probation or one of our local schools, uh, conducting intake with the family to find out what is going on with the particular youth that's referred, um, as well as what else is going on in the home, if there's other kids involved, um, what the parents might need or other adults in the household might need, and then taking a look at that intake and assessing which one of our partners from our over 50 partner organizations within the partnership can help provide the needed services for that particular youth and their families, and then referring out um, to those agencies. Um, so we are staying consistent with our numbers. Um, Similar to last year, uh, we had a total of 140 referrals for this last fiscal year, uh, which included uh, uh, 121 non-probationary youth referrals and a total of 19 probation youth referrals to the program. In addition to that, we were really busy uh, ramping up our community education arm. So um, as you might be aware or familiar uh, with some of our presentation last year, we were just um, implementing our strategic plan, our newly adopted strategic plan, and one of the arms of that strategic plan is community outreach and education. Um, so that included implementing our annual violence prevention seminar um, in November of last year. Um, this was the first seminar that we had after the pandemic, so we hadn't had it in about four years. We had over 200 people in, in attendance at that seminar, um, and the event really centered around resetting and rebuilding the partnership and figuring out what our purpose is moving forward with those in attendance, 
um, and also featured keynote speaker Luis J. Rodriguez, who's the author of Always Running, um, as well as having six different breakout sessions for our mm -hmm. participants to engage in in the afternoon session. Um, we also did our, our uh, seminar this year, but that is for next year's presentation, so you'll get to hear about that next year. Um, we were also very busy with uh, some parent education events over the last year. Uh, we hosted three parent education events, um, reaching 285 parents, and we did that with both Santa Rosa City Schools and the Rosalie School District. We also had one community presentation with 15 community members in attendance, and that was actually with the Moreland Neighborhood Action Team. Um, we also were actively involved in many outreach activities. So we participated in 55 total outreach activities throughout the past year, including one visits to Juvenile Hall in the tabling at a variety of community events and presenting to small groups of adults and youth about our programming and resources, reaching approximately 7,757 people. We also did that in collaboration with um, our newly formed gang crimes in Santa Rosa Police Department, who were really great to work with to provide some of that education around uh, gangs here in Santa Rosa. Um, next slide, please. So our primary focus over this last year has been rebuilding, um, relaunching some of our intervention programming for the partnership. This is a key component of the work that has been missing over the last six to eight years. Um, so starting with our Safe Campus Intervention Program, also known as SKIP, this is a new program uh, modeled after a program uh, we found in the city of San Jose. SKIP is a crisis response and communication protocol aimed at preventing and de-escalating incidents of violence on and around school campuses. Our partnership intervention staff, they're mobilized by schools uh, at the first sign of conflict. So we rely on the schools to call us uh, when there's conflict um, to conduct mediation and de-escalation and later to engage, mentor, and case manage at-risk and gang-involved youth. We launched the program in December of 2023, um, and by the end of June, we have 39 activations at eight total schools, um, and we break this up into three different levels. So level one is what we call our room level. So the schools are hearing, but there might be a fight on campus, but they haven't been able to substantiate that. Um, and they call us in to just come in and engage the youth, um, see if we can figure out what's going on. Um, at that level, we had 24 activations last year. Uh, level two is de-escalation and mediation. And so tensions are very high on campus at this point. The rumors have been substantiated. There may have been several fights leading up to this. Um, and so the schools will call us in to help provide de-escalation services on campus. Uh, we'll meet individually with particular students or groups of students uh, to put together individual safety plans or group agreements, um, and also just to have a presence on campus. And at that, we had seven activations. And finally, level three is crisis response. So something has happened, a critical incident on campus, whether it be a fight or something more serious, uh, we were called in, um, or there were eight activations um, at that level uh, during the last year. And since then, we have, uh, the new school year has started. We've also continued implementation. It's going very well. Um, this program also allows for relationship building and trust building um, amongst our staff and students. So they become, because they're able to spend so much time on campus, they become a regular figure that you get to see on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and we've seen that um, the more they're out of school, the more likely it is that students will feel more comfortable. So we're really starting to see that now in the new school year. In addition to that, we also started our One Circle Youth Empowerment Group. So uh, we launched a Boys Council Group at Slater Middle, Middle School in the last school year. Um, we engaged 12 students um, through a 10-week uh, Boys Council Group. Uh, they met one day per week for an hour and a half to two hours per, um, per session. Uh, which equated to about 180 to 200 total service hours for that program. Um, the biggest piece of this was relationship um, and trust building for, for staff. And so it allows staff to check in on individual students throughout the 10-week um, course. 
And it also allowed us, um, even after the, the boys' council group ended during the school year, they still stayed engaged with those students throughout the summer. So they were able to introduce them to pro-social activities to keep them busy throughout the summer, which included a trip to Armstrong Woods, a trip out to the coast, which is reflected here in this photo. I have to say some of the students that participated in this trip out to the coast have actually never been out to the beach before. Um, and you know that's may sound surprising when we live so close to the coast. Um, and we also were able to um, access some free Giants tickets. And so we were able to take the group out to a Giants game in the summer as well. Um, and last but not least is our clean slate tattoo removal program. So this program needs to be run by social advocates for youth with choice grant funding uh, previously, but unfortunately first their machine broke and they decided not to replace it. I say why over the last year. So we decided to take the program in-house, um, and this last year has really been about uh, researching different program models um, and figuring out what was going to work for us. Um, we worked with our purchasing department to do a bid process to uh, determine whether there were local clinics that were interested in participating, and through that process, we were able to secure two clinics, North Bay Laser and Laser Fresh Aesthetics, that will serve as our two primary sites for the tattoo removal service. In addition to that, uh, we um, spent the last year developing the program, program components. So um, those who are participating in the program will have to uh, provide 20 hours of community service as well as um, participation in at least four life skills classes while they um, have their tattoos removed. Um, so really it was working on getting those pieces developed as well as um, and we're currently going through the contracting process for those clinics. We should have the program up and running by January 1st, 2025. So very excited to see that come back. Next slide, please. Finally, our choice grant program. Um, I profusely apologize. We just received the year two final report from our evaluator yesterday. So I do have it in hand and we will be sending it out to the entire committee so you can read the report in full as well as it will be posted online uh, with public to review as well. Um, but what I'm going to do is just read a quick summary um, for, from our evaluators. I couldn't have said it any better myself, which is why I'm going to read this. So in year two, um, choice grantees continue to serve the community in diverse and comprehensive ways. Like in year one, they worked individually and collaboratively to connect with youth and adults across Santa Rosa, providing services and activities in all nine of the partnership's high need zones. Choice grantees continue to address urgent basic needs and provide critical one-on-one -on -one case management and therapeutic support. They also nurtured youth leaders and empowered young people to achieve new goals, doing critical violence prevention and intervention work with youth across the city. They provided opportunities for new experiences, providing creative ways for participants to connect themselves in their community. And all this work was done despite what grantees described as a time of increasing and urgent need among those they served. Grantees met these needs in year two by growing and deepening connections with other community partners, particularly with other members of the Violence Prevention Partnerships. These connections allowed for many collaborative activities as well as referrals to other support services for their participants, broadening their impact on youth and families that they served. Um, so some high level numbers here. Uh, total numbers served in year two through the Choice Grant Program was 5,197 individuals. Some of this was duplication. Um, however, we really worked with both our grantees and our evaluator to try to um, get those unduplicated numbers this year. Um, in addition, a uh, total number of service hours, 34,369 total service hours through the Choice Grant Program. We did start collecting these numbers in quarter two of year two. So um, the service hours are likely to be higher. Um, we're trying to figure out a way to gather those quarter one numbers from our grantees. Um, we also began collecting demographic data in year two, so age ranged. Um, our grantees served a broad range of ages from zero on up, but most of the services targeted um, youth between the ages of six and 24 years old. Um, and we also added how, uh, so we used the uh, results-based accountability uh, me methodology, which uh, looks at how much, so how much did we do, how well did we do it, and was anyone better off? In year one, we did not collect how well did we do it. So this year we added that piece in with our evaluator. 
um, and were able to gather information um, which showed us themes about our cultural responsivity of services, um, which are towards the end of the report here. And I'll just read really quickly that those themes include that came out of, um, of that data uh, we're ensuring that the work that we do uh, with the community youth and clients um, are able to relate to those that they serve. Um, so this is for our grantees. Uh, our grantees are able to be more responsive and prioritize the needs of those served and address barriers to access. Uh, they were able to create space for participants <coughs> to be their authentic selves and provide um, their perspectives and feedback into the programming. And finally, they're able to provide spaces that are comforting and promote inclusion um, in their programming. Um, and we are also, I'm happy to announce, um, gearing up also for Psych 12 as well. Um, so some of that work we did over the past year uh, included releasing the RFQ for Cycle 12. Uh, we did select our grantees. Um, and so we will have um, eight new agencies uh, being funded uh, to do more intervention work, um, including um, diversion work, um, therapeutic services, workforce development programming, um, and pro-social activities, as well as home building support. I believe that's the end of my presentation, so we'll go to the questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I do have a question. It's in relation to the um, more than action team, I believe. And so what kind of services are you providing for that particular um, group over there? Because I'm looking at it from the perspective of there's only a small portion of Morley that feeds into the city. So how are you utilizing, you know, the services over there? Or what is it just the educational piece that okay. reached out to us and asked, hey, we're, we're seeing a lot of gang tagging in our neighborhood. Can you come do uh, a presentation? A lot of the, the children that live in that neighborhood actually go to schools within Santa Rosa city limits. So we want to make sure that we're reaching the parents um, that have those youth to go to schools. And we also have um, uh, after school site days as well. Yeah, yeah through neighborhood services. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah, great presentation. Definitely appreciate it. All the great information. Uh, I think I'll probably, I know y'all are doing it together now uh, since you're one now. Uh, so, but I guess I'll, my first question, I guess specifically like the neighborhood, uh, the re recreational parks. I know you call you could y'all call it neighborhood services. I like that name too. But okay, rec rec and parks. All right, that's okay for sure. Just making sure. Uh, so I want to ask. I know I, I touched on this a little bit last time, but um, would you and um, I know what's on the community member that I'm working with. We're, we're kind of looking over the human development index and all that stuff. You know, like the Portrait Sonoma County County stuff. So I wanted to ask. I know with you know black children and adults, the numbers. Going down to the 3.99, you know, just, you know, just to preface my question, you know, obviously I see African American, I have like a 10 year short lifespan and just things of that nature. And so, and uh, when they looked at all the 99, they used the word neighborhoods in Sonoma County, only two scored like below four, and like one of them was Comstock. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask, do we know, if I was to ask like how many black children are involved in the rec and parks, do you have those numbers? Yeah, I remember before you all were beginning, I, mean, I think you were, I think we were having talking earlier about you all beginning to collect those numbers, but what's the, how, what's the progress with that? So uh, we've had conversations both, yeah, sorry, we're, we're, we're a department of many names, so I apologize <laughs> for the confusion. Um, so we've had that conversation more broadly uh, in terms of recreation and parks, mm -hmm. um, we have a database. At, it's tricky. We have a database that I think is over eighty thousand um, participants in our database that we've been using okay. since two thousand and eighteen, and and not collecting that. So on a broader scale, we would like to collect that. And then as we enter this next um, phase, we're looking to have neighborhood services, a section of recreation. Uh, get more engaged. Uh, back when I was working in neighborhood services, I had to do all sorts of reports for the choice grant reporting stuff. Um, so we're looking to connect that. So it's kind of on two different levels as far as recreation. What is the best way for us to, to engage and gather this information um, in situations that sometimes people, quite frankly, just don't want to share it, um, which is fine. So how do we 
how do we catch up on a database that is five years old and get that information from as many people that want to share it? Um, and <laughs> Yeah, so that the, the information that's in this report related to the choice grant agencies, making sure we get the neighborhood services programs up to speed and collecting that same information there through that, uh, the people that we contract with for that. So it is still in the development phase of Great. to get it done, yeah. No, I'm just glad that's in the conversation because I definitely think that's super important, you know? I think, uh, I know, with, you know, especially I think with like, I know, you know, with the lexicon of, you know, funding and grants, I know like people of color, and then now I know it's like black, you know, you know, there's like different acronyms, but I think like the importance of knowing which quote unquote like race of children are involved is really important, especially to me, because when we look at the numbers, the numbers are reflecting, you know, a lowering of like, you know, like, of like quality of life for certain residents. So to be able to counteract that, we got to be able to see the numbers, you know, because like my follow-up question was to ask of those children that are being served from what neighborhood are they? So I'm guessing, I, I don't know if that's also involved with the application process, but I'm just offering that. Maybe once you include the question about what your, what your race is, including like what area you're from, you know, quote unquote, I think that would help because, you know, the studies are showing that certain neighborhoods, you know, like obviously the Comstock area, that's, you know, Apple Valley, Valley Oak, and that over that area there. So being able to identify those residents that are there and seeing which ones are being served. And it's, and you know, I would guess there's a lot of youth being served from that area, obviously, you know, because I'm from there and I was involved in recreational parks when I was younger. So obviously I know, but being able to have like a metric number, I think would help, you know, it would, it would help overall. So that's great though. I'm glad that y'all are discussing that. And then, that was it for that. But they, the art thing was amazing. The, the, the art things that you all are including, that's, that's super great. So I just want to commend y'all for that. Always amazing, great work. I always see the kids running around on the park, their baseball, all those activities. So commend that. And then moving on to Bob's Project Partnership. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, you know, I was lucky enough to attend y'all last seminar. It was super amazing. Y'all had so many people there. And hey, being able to meet, you know, Luis Rodriguez from Always Running, that's really amazing. I appreciate you. I know I came with some older people. They wanted to meet the, the author. I appreciate you still letting them meet him, even though I know it was a private event for the youth. But I appreciate you, you know, like getting the kids excited about bringing like a famous author, you know, for people who don't know Always Running. It's a really, if, if uh, y'all are aware, you know, it's a book about a young man coming through, you know, was involved in the, the other world, but changed his life around. So being able to bring youth to meet him specifically, that's like, that's a phenomenal idea. So like out of the box thinking like that was, I just really definitely want to commend you and your team for putting that together. So that was really great. Trying to get homeboy industry. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That's the goal. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. And then, and I guess carrying on, it seems like you all are, it's all one department now, but with the same question about, blogging race of the youth and then where they live, I think would be great once you all, obviously you're still, I mean, you all are one, but yeah, I would definitely love to see, so I can be able to say this many youth of this race from these neighborhoods are being served. Yes, yeah. working on building that out too. Um, and we haven't gotten there yet. It's yeah. street outreach and crisis response team coming and, and be able to collect information, demographic information for that team as well. Great, great. Yeah. And then I know I would bring this up too. I know you all did say there is some like an, an Apple Valley. There's the thing that there's a site, right? Is it for, I guess, moving back over to uh, Reckon Park's neighborhood services. Uh, uh, well, how, let's see how I phrase this. Um, I think, yeah, I think it'll, once we have the numbers, it'll help to see like if youth from, like I said earlier, like the Valley Oak area are being served and being able to see numbers that youth from there are being served and, you know, their ethnic backgrounds and stuff. So that, that's something I, I would love to see. And I'm, I'm so super happy that you all are teaming up. You know, I know it's more paperwork, <laughs> blogging that we all hate. So <laughs> have fun with that. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a comment about Valley Oak. I know of a handful of families that were serving in Valley Oak. I couldn't give you an exact number right now, but we have recently, there's been more families coming from yeah. Valley Oak to our programs. 
That's great. And, and, and I, and then, like I was saying earlier, I believe that, you know, cause I'm over there and I always tell you, yo, you need to sign up for these, you know, you need to get off these streets and have fun, you know, with these amazing, like you all have so much programming. It's like mind blowing. So I definitely commend you. And like I said, just being able to put like a number to it, I think, you know, helps you. Anyone else? Yeah, a couple questions. Um, I'm just curious with the SKIP program, uh, you mentioned a partnership with San Francisco State Schools, I believe, and then you mentioned that there are three high schools and five middle schools. And so knowing how many high schools and middle schools there are in San Francisco, my question is, um, do these schools reach out directly to you? Or are you reaching out to the district itself and they're like saying, hey? The schools reach out directly to us. Okay. Uh, we're still in the process of educating each individual middle school and high school to let them know that, hey, we're here, services available. Uh, we also have partnership with the Rosen School District for SKIP as well. Okay. Um, a little bit of a hiccup this year, and they want an MOU in place first, so they haven't been calling us until that MOU is in place. Uh, we're working on it. Um, but really, it boils down to educating the administrators and counselors at the school campus, campuses so they know that they can call us directly. Uh, the district knows about our program. It's very supportive. Both districts are. Um, but really it's up to the individual school sites to call us up. And is it just the principal of that school site has essentially other kids? Principal or vice principal or counselor. And so am I allowed to ask what are the three high schools? Um, I don't have them in front of me right now. Um, off the top of my head, uh, Santa Rosa High School, the parts that we've, we've been out there. Um, I'm looking at you. Monty and Elsie. Okay, yeah, makes Monty sense. Elsie. No, I don't know for you. Okay. Yeah. And then those was essentially all of them, so that's easy. Thank you. Yep. Oh, uh, the other question is, how are students chosen for the One Circle Empowerment Group program? We look at our referrals coming through the GPS program, um, and then we, uh, after looking at those referrals for that particular school, uh, site administrators at the schools um, to then figure out, you know, do you have any students that are high priority for you? We work it out. We don't really want any more than 12. Uh, I think at one of our current schools, we have 14 participants. It's a little squirrely <laughs> in the groups so when you have more. Um, but uh, really, it's prioritizing students based on compensation for the site administrators and the referrals coming in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You good? Yep. Okay. <laughs> if there are no further questions, Okay. Um, yeah. On specific departments, but I wanted to come back to the. Okay. You ready for? Yeah, we just have to have a motion, but I think we want to. Yeah. Okay, this will go into the motion. Okay. So, um, so I wanted to raise a concern for my committee members and ask us to include it in our uh, recommendation of this heading to the council. Um, one of the things I'm seeing on the top level chart, which is. Page four of the PDF of the actual of the report, and in this we saw this in the graph of every single uh, presentation, is that our revenues over the last two years went stagnant, and then this year we saw a decline in those revenues, and at the same time we're experiencing and seeing the inflation, especially in personnel costs that that the private sector saw two three years ago, which often happens. For us in government, where we get a two to three year lag in the experiences that are on the private sector, and and so what I'm seeing in these numbers is a concern of our revenue growth either being consistent with three percent growth or declining, which this report shows declining. At the same time, we know our built-in costs to provide the same services each year are rising, and we have roughly forty-seven. FTE uh, positions amongst the various funds. One of the, I, I want to express a concern about that trend and that we're seeing it to the council officially in part because unlike the general fund, or the auxiliary funds that fund a lot of the other positions in the city, um, we don't carry a reserve fund. So we don't actually have a place to fall back to to keep these services going. And we could end up in one, two, three years in a place where a retraction of services because revenue is not coming in and the general funds aren't in a place to then backfill it um, becomes a sudden uh, occurrence. 
And while there's no specific recommendation for what the council would do here, I feel like it's very much in our uh, purview to raise this as a concern and flag that we're seeing this over the last three years. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's, a, that's a good concern. It's, it's one that we have uh, in the general fund as well, obviously. Um, so I think uh, what we can do, uh, so one, we can, we can easily put something like that, that the committee asked us to uh, monitor the, the health of the funds going forward. Uh, speaking with Veronica, I think what we can um, do going forward, uh, uh, because it will really be reflective in uh, next year's annual report, because then you'll see the, uh, uh, the continued trend of sales tax, but you'll also see the, um, uh, uh, the labor costs kick into place as they started in this fiscal year. So uh, we could put a section in the annual report. Uh, it will, we need to keep each fund separate because they are separate funds. So we wouldn't do it as one collective, but we would have each fund and we can do a uh, we can do a forecast chart on that based off of what our um, based off of what we're forecasting in the general fund for sales tax and what we know of the costs on on expenditures and and provide that look forward um, in case we are starting to erode uh, what funds are. In, uh, in fund balance for each of these. So just to kind of clean that up, there are, there are reserves. There's just no reserve policy for each of these funds. There's special revenue funds. Ultimately, it's all gonna be out on the street, but it does make sense to use uh, some unused funds as FIRE did to help with capital costs, um, but to also, uh, uh, um, you know, buy us a little time in case we start seeing a, a, a long-term deficit that's going to erode uh, the, the fund. We cannot go negative in any of these funds. That's just, we, we cannot do that. So it, it behooves us to be looking forward. And I know the budget team is already doing that. So this will be easy for us to put into presentations and also into the um, uh, annual report and we'll we'll debut something like this with the budget um, uh, uh, presentation that we'll do with you all uh, around April ish when we, when we but we can put so we can we can add something in the staff report that reflects should the committee want that. Uh, that reflects the concern coming there to uh, to have uh, staff monitor the the health of the of the funds and to report on that on an annual basis and that will just become part of it. So, I'd like to make that a motion, but also talk about it. <laughs> well, yeah. So, just I don't know about just for the annual report. I think it would be something good to have every time we meet just to be for us right. to take a look at as we're moving forward because we you know we hear a lot of things in public we see a lot of things and so if we just get it one time a year we can't necessarily prepare for that it's right. just seen it one time a year right so having it on a regular basis would be for me would be a better thought for me so i think we have I think there's two things that you brought up. There's one expressing the concern within this with this report going forward, what we're seeing from the trend of the last three years data of flattening and now refining taxes within here and knowing that our costs to provide the same services are going up. And that's what I'd like to do as a motion to go with this report. And then recognizing that everything you just said seems like a best practice for us going forward. Uh, but it's probably something that we'll have to see what it looks like the first time to, to get feedback on. So if I could take that first chunk and make that a motion, if someone was interested in seconding that. Okay. 
we need to make a motion on. I mean, th this would be to add this to that item. I so. It's it's not an agendized item. So questioning how we need to move forward. We do need to, I believe, make a motion just on the first time to recommend the report as it is to council. We will not be changing the report that we presented to you for the previous year, but going forward, we can certainly add something to the report. So I'm not, I'm honestly not sure if that is a separate motion, but we do need to existing report as it is. Yeah, because you well, would we, have to put that out in public notification in order to no. have that added correct. We're, we're I, well within I, the topic that we're talking about here to express concerns about what we're seeing within this report. I, I would think that to yeah. modify the annual report to add further detail probably would not even need a motion. It's just elaborating on the topics that are there. So I that would be my opinion. I don't think it's... Like right. Emerging from the subject matter, yeah, and it's just I, taking a recommendation from the. I mean, chair. Honestly, we would do that regardless. Okay. But I think it is expressing it as this being a concern of the committee, not just of staff as well. And so, my understanding is that we were talking about what would be included in the staff report to contextualize the feedback that we're giving in receiving this report. Yeah, and that's what that's what I. Right. That's what I was thinking that. You were asking them. So yes. you're asking to move the report with the comment to yeah, yeah to the city council and include a comment in the staff report that uh, that we have this there's concern based off of trends and and known costs coming forward and we want a further study. Correct. And that's and my that's, next. that's what Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. It's a question. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess this may be like a dumb question, but I guess it's not something of a dumb question. But I mean, wouldn't these, wouldn't the groups, how, if there was like a drop in funding, uh, I mean, I mean, all these departments, like how early do they get notified? Like, hey, you're going to get a drop in funding because of tax trends. Is it pretty? We we keep an eye on it pretty far in advance, and oh. departments are involved as well. We've actually oh. seen it happen in the past with police, where they were starting to look a little close, and they were able to eliminate some vacant positions and have them back. So it's oh. it's uh, something that we are we're aware of far ahead, and our communication with the departments about. Oh. So. so adding anything like this to this report is this piece of like transparency. Okay, which I think is helpful. Yeah. Well, you're Okay, so did anybody happen to catch the motion with the rec? My understanding the motion is with the recommendation to put the concerns to city council from okay. with, with concerns stated to be included into the staff. Report. Okay, so that might be my motion. Is to the staff. Okay, so we have a motion, need a second. Second. Okay. And we're going to do roll call. Or all those in favor? Oh, wait. Um, oh, yeah. Who do you want to? I'm sorry, guys. I forgot public comment. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone from the public? Okay. Now back to the motion. <laughs> we have a, uh, we have a, the motion. We have a second. Now we're going to go roll call. You can read if you'd like. Okay. I agree. Okay. Do you want to just uh, call or just if you raise your hand, please, if you vote aye? Okay. Thank you. It's unanimous. So, with that, let the record reflect that by majority vote it is recommended to keep this aye. All right. Move it on to. Oh, okay. Moving to item 3.2. Free outreach and crisis response team. Here. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon again. Uh, so Danielle and I will be presenting, really, Danielle will be presenting on this. Uh, really excited to be bringing 
this item in front of you today. I know Danielle mentioned in, in the previous presentation, the kind of the pillars of the new strategic plan. And, and one of those pillars being street outreach, crisis response, reentry services. Identified early on with the adoption of that new strategic plan that that was an area that needed our efforts and attention on to bring additional services into the community. Um, and so we have a presentation and, and recommendation to try to accomplish that, so. Thank you. Hello again. Um, so the goal of the street outreach uh, and crisis response team, really the goal of this whole initiative is to um, enhance and expand the partnerships and intervention services. Um, a component of gang prevention and intervention is street outreach and crisis response, which we have not had in our community for the last, I want to say almost eight years at this point. Um, this, these services provide intensive case management, whole family support, diversion and reentry services, victim support, and pro social opportunities for youth and young adults um, who are impacted by gang activity and gang violence. So previously, we did have an organization here in Santa Rosa called California Youth Outreach, or CYO, that provided this service for the partnership through the Choice Grant Program. Um, unfortunately, they lost their matching uh, funding um, and um, ultimately lost their Choice Grant funding and then had to close their doors here in Santa Rosa. Um, so we lost that service. Um, and I think also it coincided alongside with the loss of the gang crimes team with SRPD. <coughs> And then it's no surprise that we've seen a drastic increase in gang activity and gang violence here <laughs> in our community. So our hope with this street outreach and crisis response team, it'll provide a dedicated team, their boots on the ground to help the community to provide that much needed service uh, for those who are um, at risk or dabbling in gang involvement or those actively participating in gang involvement in our community. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit about the process. We released a request for proposals on August 26th of this year, um, and the deadline to submit a, a proposal for this was September 23rd. Um, we reviewed those pro the proposals that we did receive in, in mid-October, um, and here we are presenting to you um, today. Um, and actually, not December 10th, we're actually going to City Council on November 19th, as well as a typo, uh, for their approval of the uh, selected contractor for this agreement. And then services are set to begin January 1st of 12. Next slide, please. Um, so funding for this will be $600,000 per year. Um, currently, we're set on a two-year term with the funding that we have identified for this contract. So it would be a total of $2 million for the two years. The $475,000 coming from our one-time available funds in our general fund contribution um, uh, for the, the PSAP funds. And then uh, $725,000 from our fund uh, PSAP fund balance. Um, additional funding uh, for this to uh, keep it sustained past the two-year term, we are looking at a variety of different um, federal and state grant options for this. Uh, most notably is the Board of State and Community Corrections CalVet program, which is set to release next month. Uh, so we'll be taking a look at that grant opportunity uh, once we keep this going um, past the two-year mark. Um, ongoing costs will be paid for through the PSAP funds or for other grants and will not impact the general city general fund. One thing just to add to that slide, the uh... Originally, when we started talking about this, we were thinking that we'd be bringing forward a mid-year um, budget revision due to this, um, because those funding sources are coming from not just the PSAP funds, but also that general fund um, contribution. That is why this is a, a recommendation moving forward. Um, this, we are looking still starting this current year, so January 1st, uh, but those one time from the general fund would be able to cover the current budget year, so you would see this being implemented into our services budget starting when we bring the next year's budget forward. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, we did receive three eligible proposals uh, for the Street Outreach and Crisis Response Team. Uh, we had a review team assembled to review all three proposals, um, and it included reviewers from uh, Juvenile Probation, uh, the Santa Rosa Police Department's Gang Crimes Team, and a representative from San Jose City Schools. 
All three reviewers recommended the agency called New Hope for Youth uh, to receive full funding under this contract. Uh, New Hope for Youth is an agency out of San Jose, California with an extensive background um, in providing this type of services in two other counties. Um, New Hope for, for Youth will implement the Street Outreach and Crisis Response Team using the credible messenger model and a trauma-informed care approach focusing on the following items. Conducting neighborhood climate checks in coordination with the partnership and the Santa Rosa Police Department's gang crimes team. Deploying credible messengers with lived experience to build relationships with at-risk, high-risk, gang-impacted, and gang-involved youth and young adults within Santa Rosa hotspot neighborhoods, uh, also referred to as Cold Street Outreach. Engaging victims of group base and interpersonal violence, especially gang-related violence at area hospitals or in home settings to offer long-term case management and supportive services to break the cycles of violence and reduce acts of retaliation. Providing diversion and re-entry services in coordination with the partnership, Sonoma County Juvenile Probation and Sonoma County Juvenile Hall. Providing whole family supportive services, engaging parents and other family members in case management and wraparound services. And finally, providing pro-social opportunities to youth and young adults enrolled in case management and wraparound services. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so it is recommended by the Recreation and Parks Department, Violence Prevention Partnership, with the Public Safety and Prevention Sales Tax Citizen Oversight Committee, approve the use of PSAP funds to hire New Hope for Youth to implement a street outreach and crisis response team. And with that, we will take any questions that you have. Can you tell us where the staff's going to come from? Because they're in yes. San Jose, so. That's a great question. Something I forgot to mention. So uh, while they're from San Jose, they will hire work. So we'll hire people that lived here. Um, their focus will be on uh, people with lived experience as well as uh, experience doing this type of work. How many staff? Um, it'll be a team of five. So there will be a program coordinator that will be responsible for the coordination of the entire team, um, supervising the other four members, and then four youth outreach workers. Um, so a, a total team of five, and then one office assistant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The executive director of New York Youth spent um, an extensive amount of time during the first few months here in Santa Rosa, um, engaging with community partners and spending time with and indeed, you get introduced. <laughs> yeah, they've been introduced. So mm -hmm. they've uh, sat in at a policy team meeting earlier this mm -hmm. year, and they've come up uh, several different times to do some assessments and meet with partners. Yeah. yeah. What happens in year three if the grants aren't obtained? That is a great question. Um, strategic planning and, and evaluation of all services being provided and you know, as we look at that you know, the breakdown of starting fund balance um, and operational budget and those things is where do we need to invest the resource that we have through the public safety and prevention sales tax um, for the most benefit for our community. So very tactfully answered. What's that? It's very tactfully answered. <laughs> yeah. I, I asked because my... Uh, I asked if... I actually asked something on this item uh, if we remembered any pilot programs being discontinued after we started them, um, and I, no one's given, been able to give me an example of one. Uh, and I worry about the integrity of this fund because eventually we do have to go back out for renewal. And we've had a lot of starts and stops over the last over the 20, previous 20 years in some of these programs, <laughs> this, this part of the world of this, yeah. of this tax measure. And so I, something that's so crucial that we've talked about for so long um, that I know the community is going to like a lot once it's implemented. It, it's a concern to not know what's going to happen that soon. Because three years is not a lot, as we all know, it's not a lot of time. You know, time. Yes. So I, I, it is obvious to me that this expenditure meets the text of the ballot measure, but you know, similar to my previous concern in the last item, if, if we're going into, if we're looking at in three years, intentionally deficit spending while we're seeing the sales taxes plateau and go down, being really cautious about how we set expectations, uh, what we promise and, and, and 
what we're going to do. And I think that's why it's really, really important that the partnership continue with the community climate and also work with us at Katie on collecting data and what is really happening in our community right now. Looking forward with what services we can have actually. Um, and I will just say it's a shared concern, yeah. um, but there's also the reality of our community needs services right now, and we're sitting on money in that fund balance that needs to be activated for the community and not a, oh, we'll worry about that when we get there. It's, it's part of the strategic planning process, but we also can't just say, well, we might not be able to do it in three years, so we can't do it now. Um, we know that there's a need and we need to address that need. Um, and this gives us that two years to do that and not wait for two years to then say, what are we going to do? But as part of the implementation over the next two years, be looking at how do we make this sustainable um, through other funding sources or through priority setting. Yeah. The need is, is crucial right now. We heard from juvenile probation last week that their felony referrals have gone up 25% over the past few years. Um, and their, all their misdemeanors went down. Oh, like that was the fair stuff was definitely it's a real big problem and I think this is the critical missing piece of this work and I agree with all of that which is why yeah. I'm concerned about your three yeah um, we love the idea so happy that you all have been working on that uh, this, uh, I guess this, uh, this team, yeah. Um, I was gonna ask, this may just be a general question, I guess, for the board. So since like this money that you are spending, it's already yours, right? So uh, what do, why do we need to approve of it? Maybe that's, that's what I said, maybe it's not a question for you all, but is this like new funding or, so you have to get permission from us to use so in this it's already in the I know it's in the yeah. So in this current budget, it technically will not impact public safety and prevention sales tax funds yeah. um, because the half year will be able to be covered by that general fund portion. Yeah. Uh, we are taking the contract for approval of council. We wanted to bring forward to you since it's a two-year agreement and will impact the next budget that we bring for you for, for public safety and prevention sales tax. We wanted to have your recommendation tied to it in terms of Yes, this is going to be a commitment of public safety and prevention sales tax. And yes, it's in line with the mission of the ordinance and it's an appropriate spending of those funds. Okay. To kind of just, yeah. Okay. To accommodate the request to the city that you'll be doing. Yeah. As opposed to getting council to approve an agreement. And then if we brought it to you in the budget next year, and for some reason this board had an objection to public safety and prevention sales tax being used for that purpose, mm -hmm. it'd be a little late. We would have already been in an agreement and say, well, we're already in an agreement. So this gets us ahead to make sure that uh, this board has, has seen okay. that spending before the agreement is signed. Any additional questions? Uh, yeah, another one was, I know that we're reaching this organization, which, I, which I've heard of some basic things. I know you I believe you had them do, I think maybe it was someone else from that city also did a presentation at your seminar. Uh, yes. yes. It, yeah, that, yeah, that person. Uh, I want to ask: Is it? Uh, I guess. Uh, did you? Was it like their expertise that was really uh, like highlighted? Uh, I mean, were like I guess was like attractive that you all moved there instead of you all just doing it yourselves? Or I'm just I'm just wanting to see. Yeah. What, what was the? Yeah. There was a combination of things. A was the level of expertise and the number of years that they've been doing this type of work and the broad range of services they do in the other two counties. Uh, two, it was a cost savings for us, uh, mm -hmm. for us to hire that many people a little bit more um, to do so. So it, again, it saves us some money. Um, from a city's risk perspective though, there's certain things that we cannot do as city staff, such as go into other people's homes and do home visits, or mm -hmm. as this contracted agency will be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, the, one more thing I would highlight with that is Yes, that, that experience and that track record of, to the point before, sustainability, um, having built in other cities, small and starting and, and building sustainability. So some of these funding sources that we maybe haven't been able to proactively get, uh, bringing in a partner like this with a proven track record, that hopefully makes us more competitive for some of those other funding sources as well. That is a good point. Um, they, 
they on their own and to their partnership with the cities and counties that they work with have been able to secure their own federal and state funding for the work that they do in, in the other communities. So a track record was was certainly something we were interested in. Yeah. To that point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we don't have to solve all of it. They can solve some of it with yeah. us. So <clears throat> anyone else? Okay. Are there any members of the public comment, uh, excuse me, of the public that would like to make a comment? Okay, and seeing none, do we have a motion for the committee to recommend the presentation to council? A motion to recommend. Oh. Second. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard a motion from New Motion okay. first. Yes. I'll right. see. And then a second. Okay. All those in favor, will it show up hands? Okay, motion is carried. Okay. Moving on to item four, any future agenda items, which we have recommended, but is there any additional? Okay. And if we don't have anything else, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.